Hans Nieman is on fire currently in Croatia. He is having a score of four and a half out of five, crushing so many grandmasters in a very convincing manner. It's interesting to see how he is going to play in the next couple of rounds, because if he keeps winning, by the end of the tournament, he can reach a live rating of 2700. That would be a huge accomplishment, but still, four more games to go. And in round six, he's playing with the black pieces against top grandmaster from Bulgaria, Ivan Ceparinov. Let's have a look at that game. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you're a fan of me or Hans Niemann's his games, because I'm going to cover the remaining rounds of this tournament. So Ceparinov starts with the move 1c4, going for the English opening. And we get to see a very classical variation with a very nice dynamical touch. It's the so-called English four knights. So all the four knights have been developed now. And Ceparinov goes for g3, bishop b4. And now the standard move here, of course, is to Fianchetto, the bishop to, uh, to g2. There's nothing wrong with that. But Ceparinov played here the move knight d5. He doesn't give black a chance to double the pawn structure by trading of the bishop for the knight. And instead he is uh, attacking the bishop on, uh, on b4. Okay, the bishop is still defended, so that's not a big deal. But by moving the knight from c3 to d5, you're giving black the chance to play the move e4, counterattacking this knight on f3 and this usually leads to very sharp play and this game is not going to be any different it's going to be very spicy let's have a look knight under threat goes to h4 knights at the rim they are not looking that great usually but at least it's still defended by the pawn on g3 so there are no immediate tactics castling kingside uh, was played and now the move a3 it should be said though that Hikaru Nakamura played here the move Bishop G2 at the recently concluded World Cup in Baku against uh, Pagnananda. Famous game in which Nakamura lost threat and uh, the game very quickly. However, A3 is played. Bishop goes back to C5 and now the Bishop comes to G2. So the idea is to take next on F6 followed by Bishop takes E4. That's probably one idea, but the move D6 is, uh, is played. And it should be said that now if you do take on f6, the queen recaptures and there's no time to take on e4 because of checkmate on f2. That's one idea. So there's no chance for white to win a pawn. Therefore, castling kingside is played first. So now the king is safe and the pawn on f2 is well defended. And black goes for the move rook e8, overprotecting the pawn on e4. And here again, a very important uh, juncture because back in 2016 at the candidates tournaments in Moscow, Nakamura had his position as well, played the move e3 against Fishy Anand and managed to win in very convincing style in only 26 moves. Here, Ceparinov goes for a more solid move by playing the move d3. He wants to get rid of that pawn on e4. Now, after pawn takes d3, queen takes d3, the knight comes in to e5, attacking the queen on d3. And now, of course, white is going to move the queen away. And interestingly, just a few days before this game, uh, Maxime Fachel Lagrave uh, had this exact position against Ray Robson in St. Louis, another top tournament in which the move queen c3 was played. Looks like a reasonable move, a uh, reasonable square for the queen to go to, but Ceperinov decides to go back with the queen to c2. Now you may wonder why he's going to that square, not to c3. Well, the idea is shown by the game's continuation, as after the move c6, Ceperinov decides to drop back with the knight to c3. He doesn't want to take on f6. I think if you trade off the knights on f6, black is getting a very comfortable position. Nice piece play in the center. He can get the bishop out very quickly as well. There's absolutely no reason to complain with the outcome of the opening. So c6 is a good move, but Ceperinov doesn't take on f6, goes back to c3. And now we see that that's the reason why the queen didn't go to, uh, to that square. But why is Ceperinov playing this? Because the pawn on c4 is hanging. So Hans, just on move 13, is grabbing a pawn almost for free. Well, Ceperinov's idea is knight a4. He's attacking the knight on c4 with its queen. 
If the knight goes away, knight takes c5 can be played. But rather than moving the knight away, there's this move bishop e6. And that's an important move. Bishop uh, protects the knight. You develop a piece. Makes a lot of sense. And now after, let's say, knight takes c5, d takes c5, uh, black is still a pawn up. And uh, it will not be easy to regain the pawn if you play a move like uh, b3, for instance. The knight can come back to, um, to b6. Everything is perfectly under control. If you do take on c5, then the pawn on b3 is hanging as well. So altogether, it becomes clear White is not able to regain the pawn right away. Therefore, Ceparino thinks, okay, I should look for a positional compensation. I am bringing the rook to the half-open file, pressurizing the d-pawn. Of course, knight takes c5 is a threat because black is not able to recapture on c5 as it hangs the queen. But now, look what happened, guys. It's move 15 and the board is set on fire by the next move of Hans Niemann as he sacrifices his bishop. Bishop takes f2 with check. King takes f2 and the knight comes in to g4 with check. What on earth is happening here? Well, the king is wide open. And where should the king go to? In the game, there follow the move king e1. The king is looking for a shelter in the center. But let's have a look. What happens if you do put back the king on g1? Well, one very interesting plan here is to get the queen to b6 to attack the king. But the problem is there's this knight on a4 guarding that square. Now, b5 is a nice shot. This was Hans's idea. This all didn't happen, but let me show you one fantastic idea. If the knight goes away, let's say it goes back to c3. There is queen b6 check. The king should go into the corner and now it's knight f2 with another check. King to g1, knight h3, discover check, with the queen and the knight, it's a double check. So the king got to move again. This could lead to a repetition, but the standard tactic here is sacrificing the queen with queen g1, rook takes g1, and it's knight f2 with smothered mate. This is just a very standard tactical idea, but of course, this all had to be seen from really afar. Now, instead of going with the king to g1, there followed the move king to e1. And now there are various options. Uh, but the move played in the game does make a lot of sense. Hans goes for the move b5. It's attacking this knight on a4. Now, if the knight goes back to c3, which didn't happen, there is queen b6, and the queen is threatening to give checkmate on f2. Or even if you defend against the threat, maybe the queen can come in. And it's not about the material, it's about the king's safety. The king is absolutely in big trouble here, also because the other pieces are too far away to uh, to help out. So therefore, instead of going back with the knight to c3, Ceperinov played here the move rook to d4. The idea is that if you take the knight, white is going to take on c4, bishop takes c4, queen takes c4, and this position is not clear at all. I mean, white has two bishops against the rook. It's a total mess. So rather than going for this line, Hans, Played here, nice subtle move, knight from c4 to e3, attacking the queen on c2, bishop takes e3, knight takes e3, renewing the threat against the queen on c2. And now the queen is in trouble. The queen should go somewhere, but you cannot really stick to your extra piece as white. Now, there follow the move queen c3. We will discuss that in a second, but... It's very important to understand that a move like queen takes c6 is not really possible here because of the move rook c8, you're attacking the queen. If the queen captures on uh, d6, for instance, there is this move knight to c2 with a huge knight fork. Black is winning back all the material with interest and black is just going to win the game very soon after that. So that's one idea. Other idea is that if you go away with your queen to d2, to attack the knight on e3, then you first trade off that knight for the bishop, knight takes uh, g2 as well, and after b takes a4, black has regained the piece, the king is stuck in the center, and black has fantastic prospects of building up an attack against the white king. So back to the game, there followed instead this move, queen to c3. So the queen attacks this knight as well. You can obviously take on, on g2 again, but an even nicer idea is 
to play here first the move bishop to d5. That's a beautiful idea as it opens up the path for the rook to support that knight. Rook protects the knight on e3. After a move like bishop takes d5, there is c takes d5. As I said, the rook supports the knight and on the next move, you can take the knight on a4 or you can even play a move like rook c8 attacking the queen and with this rook on c8 you're threatening to give a knight fork on c2. Therefore the bishop cannot really be taken. The bishop went to e4. That's a remarkable idea. The idea is that after bishop takes e4 there's queen takes e3 as now the file for the rook has been temporarily blocked and if you do take on a4 there is rook takes e4 and white emerges with an extra piece so first you got to save this bishop bishop goes back to d5 attacking the queen queen has to move away to d2 for instance and now it's b takes a4 black has managed to win the piece back after rook takes a4 let's do the material count because white has five pawns black has an extra pawn in the center so that's looking just great for black. Note also that the white king is no longer allowed to castle because it has already moved and therefore very important rook e5. Black is continuing its initiative by getting the major pieces involved. The rook is excellently placed on e5. Soon you will see the idea behind it but most importantly the knight cannot join play via f5 any longer. Now, if you go for a move like king f2, it's queen b6. The queen comes in the, into the game with tempo. Rook a e8 is coming next. The position plays itself. All black pieces are directed at the white king. So instead of king f2, rook d4 was played. But can you see the killer move found by Hans at this point? I give you a few seconds and I will just remind you it's black to play, but make sure to subscribe to the channel. I appreciate all your support and I want to emphasize that I'm not accusing Hans of anything here. I just re rem remind you that in the past he had been um, involved with online cheating, obviously, but I'm not accusing him of anything in these games. I think he's playing fantastic chess. I think he also makes mistakes like every player in the tournament on the planet. So, hope you understand my perspective, obviously. Now it's time to show you the killer move found by Hans, and it's the move g5. You're attacking this knight at the side, and the knight is trapped, cannot go anywhere. Because if you go back with a knight to f3, it's bishop takes f3, and the pawn on e2 is pinned. So the recapture is simply impossible. As I said, the knight is trapped, Instead, if you try to save your knight by setting up a counterattack, let's say now after rook g4, you're pinning the pawn on g5. Black cannot take the knight yet, but there is h5. And then the rook is also trapped, cannot stay on the g-file. White is going to lose a lot of material. So on move 25, Ivan Ceparinov resigned. That's another huge scope for Hans Niemann. And he's on five and a half out of six, three more rounds to go. Let me know what do you think of his play and of course I will cover more action from this particular tournament and many other games which are going to be played in the next few days.